My wife sometimes believes I think like a fish, right? She used to tell me that years ago. And then I have to accept the fact, you know, honey, I do think like a fish. <laughs> um, <laughs> I do think you get to that point where you sort of, you do think like a, you begin to think like the fish for real. Like you do sort of how I feel. Like you, I'll look at a fly and you, I'll be like, okay, something has to be working along the edge there. And you didn't see anything. You didn't even see any feed map. You just had that instinct that, that the fish is there. And a lot of times they are. And then a lot of times you're like, you know, they, they're not. So my name is Omiko Clinton, and this is the Tom Roland Podcast. What's up, everybody? We have a fantastic guest for you today. Miko Glinton is a Bahamian bonefish guide, a legendary bonefish guide in the Bahamas. He comes from the Pender Glinton family, David Pender Sr., one of the pioneers of bonefishing really in the world, certainly in the Bahamas. And uh, there are so many more, David Jr., and on and on down the line. Miko is a legit superstar in the Bahamas. He is a fantastic bonefish guide and beloved by his clients. And uh, he's a he's a really good guy. I enjoyed catching up with him. We talk about all kinds of things, including what he's doing now that he is not currently guiding in the Bahamas because of Hurricane Dorian and because of COVID-19. So it was a great time to catch up with Miko. And if you do know Miko, you're going to be very happy to see his smiling face. And if you don't know Miko, get ready because this is a guy that you're going to want to know. He has a tremendous amount of bonefish knowledge and he's just an all around great guy with a really good heart. So here we go with Miko Glinton. This episode is brought to you by Fishing Points. There are a lot of great features of the Fishing Points app. You can go to your app store and you can get it and you can check it out. One of the best things that I like about that app is that it has really high quality nautical charts. We fish off the grid often and sometimes you don't have any reception so a lot of your stuff on your phone doesn't work but you can download these maps right to your phone so you can study them when you're off the grid or you can actually use them and still get depth data uh, while you are not connected to the internet. That's really cool. There's tons of things about fishing apps or fishing points that I think that you're really going to like. You can go right now to tomrollandpodcast.com forward slash points and you can get 30% off a yearly subscription and you can also start your free trial right away. So go check that out. I think you're really going to like it. Barracuda Tackle is a place where we get our cast nets. They make awesome cast nets. They have tons you can choose from there. Go to barracudatackle.com, and they have tons of other stuff besides cast nets as well. It's a great resource. Go to boathammockstands.com and get a stand that goes right in your rod holder. It allows you to hang a hammock from your boat or in your boat, I should say. You'll have the most comfortable boat on the sandbar or if you go on overnight trips, it's fantastic for that as well. And we have Empire Boat Covers. Empire Boat Covers is a very good place to get an affordable boat cover. Go to empirecovers.com forward slash TRP and you can keep all those leaves from falling in your boat. It's fall, it's about to happen. You need to cover up all your stuff. A boat cover is a fantastic way to take care of your boats, but they have all kinds of covers. Boat covers for your car, for your RV, for your grill. They have covers for everything that you can imagine. And if you go to empirecovers.com forward slash TRP, you can get 15% off your order and free shipping. So don't forget to use that code TRP to take advantage of that. And now we're getting back to the show. Miko, how are you doing, buddy? I'm great, my man. I'm great, Tom. I'm excited to be on this podcast with you. I'm excited to have you, man. You got a lot of uh, got a lot of knowledge. I'm hoping that we can share with share with my audience. And um, so I know that my audience is familiar with you. Some of them, I'm sure, have fished with you. Some of them have fished uh, Grand Bahama and know that or know your name or reputation from from fishing in the Bahamas. But we also had uh, Chris Dombrowski on to talk about body of water. And uh, so many others are familiar with that. And um, 
Body of Water was Chris Dombrowski's book that basically was a history of your family, right? Yes, yes, definitely. Especially my grandfather, David Senior, who, who's going to be so excited to know that I've been on the podcast with you. He's going to be excited about this when I tell him. He's that's, gonna be excited. that's great. Well, walk us through the history just a little bit of, uh, of your family and how, you know, what a fishing family that is. Um, great. Great. Yeah. Well, you know, um, I, come, I came from a background of uh, anglers and fishermen, even even before my family got into the sport fishing, which is bone fishing and permit and topping, um, they were always fishermen. They grew up, they grew up fishing. That's that's how that's how my family, my grandparents and great grandparents, that's how we made a living, you know, by commercial fishing. And then uh from there he got in David Sr. got into the sport fishing. He got into, he got into sport fishing. Um, and that's when he started. That was Deepwater Key, obviously, you know, was established in 1958. But David Senior, he w- he was one of the guys that was helping build Deepwater Key while he guided. Um, so he was involved with Deepwater Key long before Deepwater Key even opened in 1958. But um, I'm the grandson. I'm the oldest grandson of David uh, Senior. And even my granddad, dad, he was a fisherman also. But he was in, in the sport fishing arena like like David Sr., my dad, and myself. Um, and I'm sort of the third, fourth, third generation of bone fishing guy in my family. And then you might know because of the amount of stuff I put up with my little 12-year-old son who was crazy about fishing also. He would be for the he would be the fourth generation of bone fishing guy. Um, so I'm I, you know, the pendants are all my uncles. So when you think about all the pinders, David um, Jr., Jeffrey, all of those guys are my uncles. Stan the man, which Stanley, yeah. he's the founder. You know, he's the, he's the founding guy of North Rider Point Club. He's retired now. He don't like to say, if he, if he know I'm saying he retired, he would be pissed. <laughs> 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 he, he, he hate that word. But, um, you know, he was the founding guy of North Rider Point Club. So my father... You know, he he's a legend guide, my grandfather, my uncles. You know, so Tom, I, I don't know, even though I didn't study, I didn't study bone fishing in high school. And I say that for a reason because you and I know that this industry is is it's broad and it's spreading. And I always had a desire to see the younger generation or the next generation pick this up. And I said all that because when I was in high school, there was nothing such as fishing or bone fishing, no, no type of knowledge of that in school. And I say that because I studied electrical installation in school. Yeah. And I was I was good at that. And in my mind, that was my career path. You know, um, the company that I job, job trained for, they liked me a lot. And it was like, as soon as you graduate, come and you have a job. That's <laughs> the wire up from hotel. And I, <laughs> so I thought that was it. But not knowing... Um, uh, fishing was in my DNA, right. you know, that, that was in my DNA. And, um, as soon as I had, had the opportunity in 1996, as soon as I had the opportunity to train a deep water key under the leadership of Paul Adams, um, as soon as I did the first couple of training days with Mervin, Swerving Mervin, you know, Mervin, yeah. uh, <laughs> as soon as I, uh, trained with Mervin, uh, Mervin convinced me, even when I had the boat circling around trying to trying to pull straight, <laughs> he, he just knew, like he knew something. He was like, man, you're going to be a hell of a guy. And I'm thinking, I feel stink right now because I can't get this boat to go straight. And he saw something in me. So um, that was the beginning of it, Tom. Um, as soon as I got out on that boat and I put that pole in my hand and I began to push that boat along the flat, um, I think that's when it happened. Yeah. So all of all of the years of electrical installation and learning how to hook up so switch and three way and all that type of stuff that went out the window. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, so, you you had such a such a great place. I mean, Deepwater K was like that was like a, a serious bonefish destination. You had a oh, yeah. influx of of high profile anglers coming yes. down there. You've got great guides uh, with with great reputations, and so you just found yourself in a position to where you could you could really thrive and take off. Plus, you've got uncles and granddads, and and everyone in your family is is uh, you know from that kind of guide 
background. Now, I'm interested, when you get started, are, is everyone in your family helpful or is there competition? Like, what, I'm sure everybody kind of wants to get you started, but then when you start out fishing them a little bit, then it's, I would imagine that there might be a different story. Yeah. And what I like, what I like with your show from what I've seen is I know you keep it real on your podcast. <laughs> I saw some of your guests. <laughs> so it's good. I, I'm glad you mentioned that because, yes, it was one particular guy. And I'm going to call his name because I was afraid. Inwardly, I was afraid of him. And I think inwardly, he was afraid of me coming up. Okay. And that's none other than David Jr. Uh -huh. David, <laughs> you and I, when I got in this, when I got into it, David Jr. was sort of like, then when you hear his name, you tremble. Okay. That's, that's where he was in the industry. So I think he was the uncle that, um, he was determined that I'm not going to let this little young punk what he would call me. <laughs> I'm not going to let this little young punk come and take, you know, and, and take over the scene. And um, I remember Tom, I fished a tournament, my first tournament, uh, the Grand Bahama tournament against David Senior was, was one of the, the, the guys that I was up against. And I remember Tom on the first flat, that's how nervous I was because Dave, David Jr. was in this tournament. On the first flat, I hopped on the bow and I, and I stripped the line off. I made three, big strip and the line must have hooked around the, the reel and I made a strip and broke the whole fly line. Just, <laughs> that's how my tournament started. And I know it in myself. I was just nervous and afraid and, and I was pulling it. Anyway, so that's that's how nervous I was about David Senior. I mean David Junior, but I believe David Junior was that was that guy in the family that say, hey, this is my competition. So it was it was great until I got started. But I would say it was a friendly competition. I believe with me and my uncles, and I was at Deepwater Key, and they had already moved to Freeport. So it's always, it was always, hey, Deepwater Key against North Riding Point, North Riding Point against, and that, it was, but it's all, all good. It's all friendly competition. But you're right, it was some competition in the family for sure. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, you, you know, that's like that's bragging rights for sure. And uh, yeah. not only that, but you know that that reputation spreads like wildfire around the world, you know, with, with all these anglers that are coming to the Bahamas and, and, Oh, let me yeah. go out fish David jr. Oh no, no way. No, that didn't happen. You know? And, and <laughs> I'm sure all those anglers are talking and, and, uh, it develops some, some good competition, but you know, competition raises all ships, like a high tide raises all ships. So as, yeah, as, yeah. as there's more competition and you're trying to do a little bit better than your anglers are benefiting from it. I wonder when it yeah. is competitive like that, how do you balance like the making sure that your customers are having a, a good time and not everybody's ready for a, for a, a bonefish tournament with David jr. But right. you know, how do you balance that where you're trying to bring in some big numbers, but you're also trying to balance like this person needs a lot of work on their casting and we're just going to go have a good day and catch a couple of fish. Right, Tom. That's a that's a very very good question. It it took me a, it took me some years to figure that out too. Um, it took me some years. I've I've been guiding now, Tom. Um, well, I hadn't guided in a while, obviously, but I've been guiding for maybe twenty two, going on twenty three years. Um, and it took me a long time to figure that out. And what it is, what it is, is I believe um, once you put the angler first, if you put the angler first. I think a lot of that goes out of the window because now you're not you're not guide centered, you're angler centered. Okay, because um every guide have that level of I want to do this, I need to catch 10 fish. And you know, I, and if you sometime if you just stick to that and you forget that hey, I have an angler who can't who can't cast for it and he can spit, you know. <laughs> If, if you if you don't keep that in mind, it, it's all about what my goal is. I want to catch ten fish, but I realize this angler needs you know he needs practice, he needs training, he needs a couple of tips, tips ahoy. Um, then it gets then it gets crazy, Tom. So I really do believe that once you put the angler first, and then you say, okay, this is about this angler that's on my boat. This is about me making sure that this angler uh, gets better. You know, he learns as much as he or she could. Um, I think that makes it easier. But when it's just the, about the guy, then and then it turns into frustration because right. I want I want to leave the flat with ten fish, but we only have one, 
and it's 3.30 and we leave at 4. <laughs> yeah. You know, so now I'm, instead of me being happy because he's casting 40 feet instead of 20 feet, I'm still, I'm still uh, a little pissed because I'm, I'm only at one fish, which he's, he's a better caster. And I'm all about um, making sure the angler that is on my boat leave a better angler than they were when they get on my boat. That's sort of the, that's sort of the big, one of the big things about my boat. Obviously catching fish, but making sure my angler is a lot better. And so that's a very good question, uh, Tom, for a lot of guys, because we, if we're not careful, I, I, for years, I wasn't thinking like that. For years, it was about, I want to, I, I need to beat David Senior. If he comes in with five fish, I need seven. Yeah. I mean, David, David Jr. So, and a lot of times you take that out on your angler. If you're not careful. So right. If that helps, yeah, yeah, it can certainly happen because, you know, a, a good guide or a guide that is very talented has oftentimes the guide wants to catch the fish way more than the angler does. And, yeah. you know, and it, it's more important. It's really more important to the, to the guide to catch that fish than the angler. The angler just wants to have a good time. And that's, I, I believe that's a big part of the, the, the mature, the maturation process of a guide. Like you, you've been guiding for 22 years, probably in the first four or five, you know, like you're saying, you're just trying to match the other guides, maybe not even yeah. competing with David Jr. yet. And then it's like, right. Right. Okay, now I'm competing and I'm going to show everybody who's the best. And then you forget yeah. about your angler and they're not yeah, having a good true. time. And then eventually you mature to the place where your angler's having a great time and you're the top dog, right? Like, right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but some of that, best. some it's of that top best. dog comes from, from years of training those customers and getting them better and better and better. So each year they show up better and then, you know, few years later they're having those big days right right that that's so true that's so true tom i i was messing around with something in the last couple of years i was calling it i call it the me team right obviously the me me is is the brand that i guess i've been working on the brand for 22 years and finally i finally a few years ago decided to put the brand out there and the me is obviously miko experience and uh tom it's amazing how that that name came about uh, most of my anglers, when they leave my boat, most of them will come and say, Miko, you know, there's like, I, I wasn't on a fishing trip. They said, I had an experience with you. Nice. And I heard it so much that I say, you know what? That's pretty cool that these, these are anglers are saying that if they had more than a trip. They had an experience. And that's when I decided to say, oh, you know what? Me, Miko experience. It sounds good. And I decided to brand it and that's, I have it on today. But, um, that's I started something called the Me Team, and um, and it, it's it's the same. It's it's from the same thing. It's the, I'm I'm looking for people that that um that love the sport, that are passionate about the sport, and um once once I get them on the flat and they I can see that hey you know what these people are having an experience or these people want to I always say you're part of the Me Team. Like we had an awesome time on the flat yeah. when we fished. Yeah. Okay. I would I would gladly accept you to be a part of the me team if you see you want to. But anyway, Tom, I'm I'm enjoying these I'm enjoying the pressures of the conversation. I hadn't done a, a, a sit down in a, like this in a while and yeah. these type That's awesome. So, really cool. so so tell me the difference in your opinion of an experience versus a, a, a day of guided trip. Uh a Miko experience. Well, I, I believe it starts even before you get on the before you get on the water. It starts because you know we at the lodge, you come you come you come down from from breakfast. You meet the guide at their boat in their truck, and from there, I believe it starts from there. It starts really early for me. It starts on my way to work because I got to drive fifteen minutes. So you know we got well, we had beautiful pine trees, <laughs> green pine trees, and you know, and I would just take I would take advantage of that fifteen minutes Tom driving to work. Either I just listen to nothing at all. And just meditate and, you know, think of be thankful about the day. And so I try to start my day from on the way, on the way to work. Mm -hmm. So by the time I get to work, if one of the guys have something crazy or to say, which someone will have something, I'm already mentally, I'm already set. And so when my anglers come, you know, I greet them, you know, we begin to, you know, talk about fishing and the day and everything. So it starts, it starts from there. And really and truly, um, once we get on the water, it's like a, I change. I always tell people it's like 
It's one Miko before I get to work. And then when I get to work, it's another Miko altogether. But I think the experience have a lot to do with the whole. From the time I wake up in the morning on my way to work to the time I greet my anglers, um, the truck ride. You know, we try. I try to make the truck ride uh, a little interesting because, you know, we have some roads that we have to get through to get to some good fishing, by the yeah. way. So the roads might be tough, but the fishing is really good. And I try to make use of that time. Either we're going to talk about fishing, flies, what's going on. So we make use of that time also. But um, really, the passion I have to see people better, live as a better angler, I think that's what gives them that experience. Because most of them, they say they fish all around the world, but they had they had um, they don't have a whole lot of people that is that concerned about them becoming a lot better angler. And I think that's what really I think that's the X factor, in my opinion, is the harder help to see people better than they were before they um, came. Yeah. And it's not about it's not about hey, are you getting paid? Because I've had this before. Hey, you're not you're not getting paid extra to do all of that. And I'm thinking, in the long run, I am. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, so Tom, I, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's the whole, it's the whole deal. I think it's from the beginning of the morning all the way to the end of the day. Um, I would normally be the last one to leave to go home. And some, some folks feel like, oh, he's doing extra. It's not really doing extra. It's making sure that I give a full day and making sure I give everything for that day. And so it's started from, from beginning to end. So mm -hmm. that's what makes that would make the whole Miko experience, in my opinion. And in, in, in my opinion, that's why you have such a good reputation uh, is because you're putting in those those type of hours and you're paying attention to those kind of details. One thing I'd like to talk to you about, you're you're a, I would think I would I would call you an instinctive guide like you. Mm -hmm. You just seem to and I hear this from other people that have fished with you that you just kind of seem to know where to go like you. And, and it may be someplace that you've never been before or, or never stopped on before. And then all of a sudden it's like, you just stop and we're, we're, we're going to fish here and you see something. I don't know. I mean, a lot of guides are like that, right? Like you have, you have some guides that are very like they're on the clock. We have to be at this particular flat on this particular tide. And that's where we're going. And we're not stopping to look at anything. And, and those right. guys can be very, very successful. But what I noticed about you is that you're, you're more fluid. You're looking and you're not afraid to stop there. So let's talk about your philosophy about like how you plan the day, what you're looking for, um, and, and how that might change with the conditions. Yeah. Well, um, by, you know, I, I like to explore. I'm, I'm, I like to explore. So the things that most guides wouldn't do or the places that they wouldn't go, I would I would intentionally go to explore it and, and to see, you know, to see how the grounds is and to see how the fish is moving and working along there. So that's one of the reasons I would stop anywhere and check check it out. And then um for some reason, pulling pulling a boat for me is is fun. I know it could it could be it could be wrenching and it could be tiring something, but pulling a boat for me is a it's a technique and it's fun too. So um when I'm Pulling along the flat, that's some guys try to avoid pulling a lot because it's you know it's it's a lot of work. So they would try to they would move and run a lot. But sometimes I would pull, and when I'm pulling through them, I'm not just looking for the fish. I'm looking at the I'm looking at the grounds. I'm trying to see if there was you know the type of feed marks and all this type of stuff. So I'm looking at a lot of little things, a lot of little detail stuff uh, when I'm pulling the flats. But you know. There are areas that I know fish would be with the high tide. You know, I know they like to hang around this mangrove at high tide. And most of the spots like that, where those fish just sort of hang in a spot, you always know you're not the only guy who knew that they're there. <laughs> <laughs> because everyone sort of figures that out. But it's those areas where you go and explore and you find these fish that no one else really explore. Those are the fish that would normally be there and the other guys don't know. You see, but all of the, you know, there's some places if you fish ground Bahama enough, there's some places where even the anglers know they'll be yeah. like, <laughs> <laughs> the minute they the minute they hit the island, they'll be like, let's go at brush key with high tide because they know there's 200 fish there, right? <laughs> but everyone else sort of know that also. And you can go there if you go there early enough and you go there first, you know, you you can you can, you know, you can rip some lips. But um, uh, but other than that, those places that I explore, 
I, and, and, you know, do my research and find these other spots. And sometimes, uh, so when, when the guys are having a hard time in those other popular spots that is already a little beat up or the fish is already, the fish already know the, the fish, some of those fish know your middle name. That's how, yeah. that's how much yeah. guys fish them. And, um, but it's those other areas that I find by exploring, um, those are the ones that keep me on top of my game because when guys are coming in with two fish, I'm coming in with five or six or a couple of big fish. It's those same areas that the other guys sort of, they refuse to explore and check out that I'm saying, hey, you know what? I'm going to take a half an hour and just pull this flat and, and check this flat out. Yeah. And that's really something that is, there's a balance there and it takes it. I don't know. A guide has to be confident. You have to be confident enough to know that you can take that half hour out of the day when you've caught nothing. And it's like, okay, we've caught nothing right now. It's 11 o'clock. I'm going to take 30 minutes and look at this place that I've never looked before. That takes a tremendous amount of confidence because it now do. it's going to be 12 and you still hadn't caught anything or you might catch something. But how did you, how do you balance that of, of like making sure that you're, you're catching fish and stuff like that, but when do you explore and how much do you explore? And sometimes I would think like, uh, when I was guiding is like, look, it's tough right now. The fishing is tough. So it's probably going to be tough everywhere. So when is there a better time to explore? Like it's probably going to be tough everywhere. So if I find a couple of fish in this place that I've never been before, that probably means on a good day, there's going to be a lot of fish there. Right. Yeah. And yeah. I don't know. That's kind of how I did it. I was just kind of wondering how you did it. Yeah, no, no, you right on. You right on. If you, if you catch fish there on a tough day, on a good day, they would, you know, it should be, it should be a lot more fish there. And uh, again, Tom, those that's that's where the instinct comes in, you know. Um, and I really believe uh, the mature guides and the really good guides. It is an instinct. It's almost it's almost hard hard to explain. So my wife sometimes believe I think like a fish, right? She used to tell me that years ago, and then I had to accept the fact. You know, honey, I do think like a fish. <laughs> um, <laughs> I do think you get to that point where you sort of you do think like a you begin to think like the fish for real. Like you do sort of have a feel like you, I'll look at a flat and you, I'll be like, okay, something has to be working along the edge there. And you didn't see anything. You didn't even see any feed map. You just had that instinct that, that the fish is there. And a lot of times they are. And then a lot of times you're like, you know, they, they're not, but like you say, you have to sort of, you have to be able to, um, depends on my angler too. So I might, let, let me say this depends on the angler you have. Uh, it determines a lot of how I make a move, to be honest with you. So, you know, I know you can handle yourself. So if I have you on my boat, I'm going to take more risk. I'm going to take more risk. I'm going to, I'm going to hit like spots where there. No one fished that in five years, but Tom on my <laughs> boat, I go and check that out. Right? Because I'm I not know sure that's a good have- thing. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, I'll take this guy over there. <laughs> but uh but you know you got other you got some other anglers who you know they 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 knew at it they really they're not they knew at it and they they really need to get a lot better and you wouldn't you wouldn't take much of that kind of risk with them you would you would actually take them to the you would try to get to brush key first and some of these other places because yeah. you know they got they have a better chance of hooking up and getting into it so i think that's a big part of it tom the angler the angler that is on your boat really have a uh, it, it, it plays a big role on how you make moves and yeah. what you decide to do I, what, I really believe what about what's your thought on communicating with the angler and letting them know like obviously you're going to get some guys and they love to explore like me and miko found a new spot like that would they would take that home as like a badge of 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 honor or a trophy but oh, yeah. how do you feel <laughs> about communicating with them about what it is that you're doing. Like this is a brand new spot. I've never been here. Like, is that something that you would do or do you kind of hold that to your close to the, close to the vest? Yeah, I think, I think that goes with, uh, it goes with the same thing we said a little bit. It depends on who the angler is. Yeah. I think it depends on who they is. I would say it like, um, <laughs> Tom, Tom, I share this story cause I'm on your podcast, right? 
Because your audience would, because this sort of how uh, this helps with what I, what I, what I want to say too. So I have been, I had this angler. I've been fishing with him for years, and he doesn't mind me saying his name, Stu Reese. He, he 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 was a homeowner at Deepwater Key, really good guy. Um, actually, me and Stu Reese fished the Redbone tournament in Alamarada in nice. 2008. And and I won that red bone tournament. Right and he, I I remember you, that. Yeah, you man. remember that? Yeah, right? we were fishing those things too. <laughs> yeah, so he he was that guy that I was with. That we, we, we built a really good friendship. He said, Nico, your goal, your job is to teach me, help me to become the best angler I could, and I'll just pay for us to fish wherever. And I was like, deal. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> and so and so uh, that's he thought it was time for me and him to fish a tournament, and that's how I ended up in that tournament in Alamorada, which was great because I won that, that tournament. Um, but but I say that me and him, we were fishing in Moors Island Tour, okay, and I was coming back to Grand Bahama from Moors Island. I know where I normally leave from when I'm just we wasn't using any devices then. It was like just strictly, hey, sun is up here. This is west, that's east, you know, that's old school, right? Yeah. <laughs> so I normally know where I leave from when I'm going back to Grand Bahama. He wanted to go check another spot on the backside of Moors Island where I'm not familiar with. But I was like, hey, I'm with Stu Reese. We like to explore. Let's go. And so we went on the backside of Moors Island. And now it was time to come home, Tom. I was not leaving from the exact spot where I normally leave from. I thought we were at that point, but Moors Island had a, 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 it was another spot that looked like the same, right? So it was a nice smooth day, and I was coming back to Grand Bahama, not knowing we left on a slightly off angle. Yeah. And I was riding for about, I was, we were in the boat for about 30 minutes, and I didn't see any land. It, I know from my experience, if you ride for 30 minutes and you don't pick up no land, something is wrong. Mm. So at that point, I knew, I was like, oh boy, something is actually wrong. I said, let me go for another 10 minutes. But I went 10 minutes more, no line. So I, <laughs> I slowed down in the middle of nowhere. And he was like, what's going on? I was like, uh, I was like, you know, Reese, I got to tell you this. I think we lost. <laughs> 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 so like, he was one of those guests where well, I didn't mind saying that because that's that's sort of how it was with me and him. But I would not have done that with a lot of other angles. I wouldn't have done that, you know. Um, I would have tried to figure it out before I did that. So I said all that to say uh, depends on the angler because I wouldn't have done that and said that with any other angler. Well, let me finish it so the audience would realize what happened. So I kept going. I know we missed Grand Bahama because we didn't see it. So I know we, we were away from Grand Bahama. So I kept going, kept going. And then we did pick up the land way, way in the horizon. And I said, okay, we're going to go there. And when we went there, Tom, it was actually Abaco. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> it was actually Abaco. And so anyway, um, we got to Abaco. And I, I hop up on my platform and grab my cell phone. And I picked up like one bar. I was like, ah, I'm guarantee you we're, we're in Abaco because if you miss Grand Bahama in Abaco, you go into Europe. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. <laughs> yeah, you gotta go. You gotta go to uh, maybe hit Bermuda. You might hit Bermuda, but other than that, you go into Europe. So I said, this has to be Abaco. Um, anyway, once we got to Abaco, we were all the way in Marsh Harbor, Abaco. So we was in like Crown Haven, where you hop over to Grand Bahama. Long story short. Um, we just kept going all the way along Abaco Shore until I get to like Crown Haven, those areas that I was familiar with. And then all of my confidence built back up. So I was like, okay, this is where we are. And I did stop. I did stop and fish. And we didn't get home until eight o'clock that night. But I stopped at a spot and I fished. And we had, the, we had an amazing, amazing hour of fishing. It's like it wiped away all of that. Uh, you know, all of me being lost and all of that. They wiped that away for a while until I got in. And I don't know who Stu Reese decided to tell, <laughs> but the next morning, the next morning when I got into work, all the guys were giving me crap about me being lost. <laughs> so anyway, I I, so I said that story, Tom, to, to say to the audience, that's how it is. Uh, depends on the angler. So I would have dealt with that completely different if it was a new angler, someone that I didn't know that well. And who I didn't have that kind of relationship with, I never would have just said, "Hey, 
we lost. Yeah. I would I would I would have worded differently, <laughs> but um, <laughs> so. that's one of the things that you don't want to hear, like the pilot saying "uh oh." Or your your or you know something like that. You don't really want to hear your guide say, um, "We're lost." That's, yeah, yeah, no, you a, don't want to hear that. It's not a good. You thing. don't want to hear that. No. <laughs> so speaking of a lot of the anglers that you fished with, you know, Grand Bahama, Deepwater K, and North Riding Point, both places that you've worked for a long time, have attracted a lot of famous anglers. I know that you have fished with Lefty. Haven't haven't you fished yeah. with Lefty? Oh my God. So yeah, rest, what, what rest was that like? Up. I mean, Lefty Cray was such a, such an incredible person. He was a great angler, um, but he was a funny guy. Uh, what do you oh. remember about fishing with him? Oh my God. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So me and Lefty had a good relationship. Um, and I think what, what, what uh, tears me up a little bit talking about Lefty is he, he became so, him and my son became so close. I have a photo. I have a photo of, uh, a few years ago, this was the last time I saw a lefty. Um, I have a photo of it in my uh, in my phone at the ICAST here in Orlando. Um, and that's when Lefty wasn't moving around that much, as you know. He was he was he was in his he was at his boot, but he wasn't moving around. He wasn't doing no casting. And um, a few guys who knew our relationship was like, "Hey, I'm going to take you to Lefty boot," and I was like, "Okay, he's going to freak out because my son is with me." And he didn't know that. And man, when we got around, we snuck around the boot, man. And I don't know who the folks was he was talking to. I know they were important, but man, he he made us feel he made us he just forgot that he was talking to some folks when he saw me and my son. And my son ran over to him. And I have this photo with uh my son is sitting on Lefty lap. And Lefty, I mean the biggest smile, Lefty has my son, and I'm kneeling down on the side of my son. And all, I mean, every tea that I had was, was just uh, out because I was so excited and I was so happy to see that. And um, that was my last moment and my son last moment with Lefty because afterwards, a few months afterwards, we found out that he had passed away. So that was my last memory with Lefty. But I've, I've had a lot of memories on the boat, fishing it with Lefty on the boat. One of the things we have in common, he is a teacher, man. He's a teacher by heart. Like, me and the guy that is fishing with me and Lefty, they catch they catch a lot of hell. When I say catch a lot of hell, if they want to fish, 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 they're in trouble. Because once Lefty get up, he's talking about casting. I'm giving him crap about his cast. And he definitely gives me crap about my cast. And we always trying to help each other get better. We always talking about techniques and what could we do. And, and that's one of the things I really love with Lefty. I think besides, besides um, a hell of an angler, and all the knowledge he had and when it comes to fly fishing and everything that he gave and, and when it comes to fly fishing, I think he was he was a real teacher. He was a he really wanted to see people get better. And I think that's one of the things that um I would always hold on to. But uh he is a funny guy. Like I he has jokes for days. Like, I mean, you never pick a joke fight with Lefty. I, I learned that the hard way. Like, do not pick a joke fight with him. I, I, I messed around a couple of times because I like to, you know, uh, say little things here and there. And you say one joke to Lefty, he's going lefty, he's gonna hit you with 10. Like, you say one, he's going to hit you 10 times. And um, I know one of the things he said, it wasn't really a joke because I'm using it in real life now. He said, Miko, he's like, I'm going to teach you something about marriage. Uh, I said, oh, I need that right now. <laughs> He's like, I'm gonna teach you something about marriage. He's like, you know what? And um, and I guess it was popular over here, but it wasn't popular in the Bahamas because I hadn't heard it much. He's like, if you want a successful marriage, you just gotta learn two words, Miko, two words. I was like, what's that? He's like, yes, ma'am. <laughs> 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 he's like, he's like, Miko, those two words gonna save you. Yes, ma'am. And you know what? I've been married 17 years now, and I I think he had, he knew something because the more I learned to say yes, ma'am, the better it is. <laughs> hey, he's a he's a and wise so, man. He's a wise, he's a wise man. man. He's a wise man. But yeah, left, lefty man. Um, I can't say enough about him. Um, the the time I cherish the time even more now that he's not here, that I had the opportunity to spend with lefty on the boat. But um, he's just uh, he's an all around guy. You know, he's a really, really good guy. He's a hell of an angler. He loved to teach. 
Um, I mean, he taught me a lot. I mean, even though I grew up in the Bahamas and I fished all the time, he taught me a lot of stuff. And um, um, I'll end with this. You know, Lefty obviously was a lot older than I was. And so when it comes to casting, I always do tricks to, to, to knock him off. I always do tricks. I'm like, okay, I know I'm gonna get this old guy. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, keep, I'm gonna wrap myself in the line cast and spin out of it. And he hate when I do that. He's like, oh, sit down, you will show off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know. Um, and and I, I remember many times, man. You know, me and him just going at it, and everyone is doing well. I say, okay, I'm gonna take it up a notch. And I said, Lefty, um, you gotta check this out. And I wrap myself in my, wrap myself in the line. And uh, once I get that rod loaded, and I. And I load it to the top. I do this Michael Jackson spin. And before the line line, I mean, before the line line, I'm, I'm out of it. And the line is, you know, and he's, what the hell? I'd be like, yeah, let me try that. <laughs> uh, believe me, he went home and tried it. He didn't try it on the boat, but he tried it at home. He's like, man, I wonder if I could, I wonder if I could work that into my my casting yeah. demonstration. But he, he had some he great ones, great, man. He had some great yeah, little he, he demonstrations. Great yeah. Yeah. What about some other people that you that you fished with? Um, um, Liam, Liam, Liam was a cool guy. Liam Neeson, you know, from the movie Take It. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I yeah, I just showed someone yesterday a photo with me and Liam uh, and the Buccaneer Bonefish, the, the Bonefish and Buccaneer show. Um, someone I posted and I screenshot it and I have it in my phone. I was like, hey, I gotta keep this. It's like me and Liam, and I just showed it to someone yesterday. Because the person was like, what do you do, man? You always ask, like, hey, I'm, I'm actually a fishing guy. And I was like, I had to, uh, and I was like, let me show you one of my clients. He, he, he freaked out. He thought I he thought I photoshopped. I was like, no, that's a real <laughs> photo. <laughs> and so um, Liam Neeson was cool because, you know, uh, I never dreamed, Tom, like growing up as a kid, never, never, even Lefty Cray, I've never dreamed that I would have met the people that I've met and the relationship that I have now. I never dreamed it. So um, it's almost like I when I go to the movies, like to watch his movie, like folks think I'm crazy because he, he'll do something in the movie. I'll be like, yes. And then they'll be like, calm down. <laughs> <laughs> and they don't know that, hey, I personally know this dude. And if I ever say that, they're going to think I'm on drugs, you know? So <laughs> so if I ever say that, they're going to think, hey, he's cuckoo. He's, you know, he's making it up. But um. Uh, Liam Neeson, when I fished him, I don't know if you knew this, Tom, he he was, he had just went through something crazy the first time I fished him. He literally had lost, he had lost his wife. Oh, no. Yeah, yeah. He had lost his wife for a couple of years prior to that um, on a skiing trip. And so I met him at a, I met him at a, at a critical time. And the type of person I am and some of the other things I do, Tom, you know, where I, you know, I minister to people and, you know, I be there for people. So we had a, we got a, a certain attachment because I, I understood what he was going through and I was sensitive to that also. And so I was trying to give him this Miko experience and all this stuff, knowing that he's going through a lot. And um, so I would always remember that because he was going through a really tough time. But we, we had an awesome time. I, I think I put Liam on his first bonefish on that show. And um, whoever that whoever the person was that fixed his rig, I don't know who did it or where. Uh, Liam was having a tough time, Tom. He was having a tough time, and I was like, "Hey, I'm not gonna tell him nothing. He's doing wrong because this is Liam Neeson. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not like you know." But he he was having a tough time, and I was working with him all day, all day until the ending part of the day when he caught his fish. And I was like, I don't like to take my angler's rod unless I have to, right? Right. That's one of the things. I was like, I'm not going to take that rod in my hand unless I have to. And um, I decided, I said, you know what? I have to see what's going on. And I took his rod, Tom, and I catch, I cast it, and I couldn't cast this thing for hell. <laughs> and I'm thinking, what? It was something. And I stripped it in and looked at it, Tom. Whoever rigged this rod put the put the fly line on backwards. Oh, no. So he was. He was trying to cast with the running line and the weight forward line was way down in the yeah, back yeah. <laughs> next to the back. So I was like, I was like, Liam, I was like, sorry. I was like, sorry, but you you were trying to cast with the running line. I was like, you actually did good with casting with the running line. <laughs> anyway, so I switched rods and he right away, he 
his casting got better because he was using the proper part of the line. And he, he got his first one or two bonefish with me. And that's my experience with Liam. But I shared that uh, about what he was going through because to me, that's one of the other things that I've experienced over a lot of years. There are people that comes on your boat sometimes. You don't really know what they leave from or what they're going through. But I've had opportunities to really be there for a few people that was really one, one guest. He was waiting for his brother to come on the trip. While we were fishing, he got a call. His brother passed away. Oh, man. Now, he's, he's waiting for his brother to come to Deepwater Key. And he must have been a tough guy because he didn't break his hair. He didn't, he didn't, he didn't show much emotion. I'm thinking, I, I, I lost a brother to him. Like, I lost a younger brother on a boating trip, mm. okay, who I hadn't, hadn't seen him in, what, 18, 17 years. Last time I seen him, him and, him and his friends went out on the trip, and that was it. So I know what it was to lose a brother. And um, this guy got a call on my boat to his brother's past, and he didn't react. And I'm, all day I'm thinking, um, this got to be tough for this guy. So, Tom, on my way in, no lie, on my way in, I decided to pull back my throttle and I slowed the boat down. And he looked back like, hey, we're going to stop at another spot. I was like, no. I was like, I overheard the conversation. I know you lost your brother. And I was like, I know it's tough. I was like, could you give me this opportunity to just hold you and your wife on and just, just say a prayer with you guys? And he started crying as soon as I said that. Like, he didn't cry when I when we prayed. He cried when I said it. And so I knew right then that was the right thing. And um, he felt it as soon as I said it. Because I think he was holding all of that in all day. Yeah. And as soon as I said that, he broke down. So um, that's just a few experience, Tom, that I personally um, had um, during my years of, of, yeah. of guiding. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't give that up. For, I wouldn't give that up for anything. Those are the, those are the things that have been ingrained in my memory that I always remember. Yeah. Um, unfortunately he, he has passed on now too. Um, so, um, and that's, that's all I can hold on is the memory that I sort of created with these people, even like with less people. The only thing I have now is those great memories that right. I've built with, with them. You got a good heart, man. You, you got a good heart. You can see it. You can, you can just yeah, see it and too. feel it. And, and, uh, you know, a fishing guide, a lot of times, you know, like people that don't understand the sport and don't kind of understand the, uh, the bond that the angler has with the guide and the guide has with the angler. Some people don't realize and other people realize very, very well, like the people you're talking about that, that a fishing guide can be far more than somebody that just points out some fish to you. A fishing guide oh. can turn out to be, I mean, you've seen it. You, and, and every, when I went down to deep, I mean, uh, to North Riding Point and visited you guys down there, you could see it with Cole and, and all the guys that we were with. And, and there's this friendship and this bond and this, and this, you know, it's, it's, it's almost indescribable. Like you see this person yeah. one time a year, but you're like super close with them yeah. and, and yeah. You're, you're not afraid. And some of these people are coming down and they're not afraid to bear their soul and tell, tell their fishing guide something that they wouldn't tell their best friend at home. Like it's just too yeah. close, you know, but yeah. here you are, yeah. you're in the Bahamas, you're in the Florida Keys or you're whatever you spent four or five days on the boat. And then all of a sudden here, it just, it just comes out and they just start telling yeah. you stuff. And, uh, yeah. You know, some guys are are better at it than than others. And you, with your with your ministry and everything that you do on the side, uh, it, it lends itself very well to that. But but you're also you got a good heart, man. And you're a good friend to people, and and I'm sure that a lot of these anglers, uh, a lot of these anglers uh, understand that you know instinctual instinctively that that you're a good person. They want to. They're not afraid to tell you those kind of things. Right, right. I really do appreciate that, Tom. Yeah, and for me, Tom, I think that's where ministry. It helped me to realize ministry is like broader than a lot broader than what it's been portrayed as. And so I take advantage of my my office or my if I would say pulpit, my pulpit is the flats. Yeah. You know, some people pulpit is a big, big building with all that other stuff. I feel like my that's my arena. So I do I do take advantage of those opportunities where I can reach people in my sort of in my zone. Yeah. And so Yes, I do take advantage of that. Yeah, well, that's cool. Um, so one of the things that uh, we obviously need to talk about is is what's going on with you right now. I mean, you're you're. We were just talking about you know how you 
how you uh, kind of minister from your pulpit being the flats. And um, because of recent events, uh, the hurricane and COVID, you're yeah. you're not there right now. So tell tell us about where where you are, what you're doing, and and uh, kind of what you what, what's going on in the Bahamas. Right. So yeah. So since um, since Hurricane Dorian, it's been it's been it's been crazy since Dorian, and it's been crazy for me and a lot of other people. Um, uh, I think this is the longest stretch that I've been out of work. You know, where I've hadn't been on the flat or hadn't been in my pulpit to say. Um, it's been, yeah, since, but it's been since Hurricane Dorian. And then we actually went back to work, I think like from January, a little bit in January, February, and then March, March came with COVID. And so we shut down again in March. And from March on, um, it's just been no work and, you know, no flats, no flat fishing. Anything. So it's been extremely tough. And Grand Bahama, it's, it's, it's a little, uh, it's tough for most of the people in Grand Bahama, obviously Abaco. Um, some of the Bahama Islands, is, they're okay, but they're still having a hard time with the COVID because most of the, you know, most of the United States and other countries are shut off from the Bahamas now, as you guys may know. And because tourism is such a big part of our, our economy and industry, um, I think we're learning some crucial lessons now. Um, when it comes to, you know, how much we depend on, on a particular thing, because now that uh, everything is shut down, it's really difficult. So you got 80% of the people, um, and this is not, this is besides Grand Bahama and Abaco, which was dealing with just getting bruised and smashed down by Hurricane Dorian. Um, I'm talking about the rest of the Bahamas, just the fact that there's no tourists coming in and they're not coming in the way that they used to. It's tough because there are many people that are without jobs, don't have any work, don't know what they're going to do. Um, so it makes it makes life pretty, pretty tough. Um, I was fortunate enough um, through some of my relationships um, over here in the States to be able to bounce back and forth a little bit between Grand Bahama and the United States. And most of that after the storm was just folks that. I have a relationship with who love me and my family and say, hey, you know what, you guys, we got to get you out of that. We got to just get you off that island for a couple of months. And as you know, um, that happened with us. And after September, we were able to come in the States for a few months um, just to catch ourselves from just mm -hmm. really to get away from everything and just to breathe a little bit. And that was great. And obviously, all of those, all those have expiring time, uh, as you know. And so. Um, we went back home thinking, okay, we're going to go back. Work is going to start. We're going to get back on our feet. And then again, COVID-19 hit and it went back to like, oh my God, we're back to, we back to square one again. So um, in my, in my mind, Tom, there's a lot of things that's been going on in my head pertaining to the industry and what I could do and what I like to do. Um, I, I'm taking a note from, what I'm doing with you today, which I yeah. think is so cool mm -hmm. um, to be able to connect like this, um, you know, to do online stuff, to create a website. And that way I can still stay in contact with, with my clients and my friends and even build new clients and, yeah. new, you know, new friends that when the borders do open and when things do get back, um, I would even have other people, new people that I can, who probably I met online like this right. to say, Hey, you know what? I'm going to go down and have this Miko experience. And so I'm thinking about a few things, Tom, that I can do during the meantime, because it is a little tough when you have a heart to guide and you want to be out there on the water and you want to continue to, to do what you've been doing, but you just can't. Like right. it's, it's beyond, it's beyond me. You know what I mean? It's like, yeah, there's a lot of things I used to con be able to control, but this is beyond all of our control, what we are dealing with. I mean, you are, the whole world is deep, um, dealing with a pandemic. So it, it teaches you when you get in that position, like, okay, what's, what else you got in you, Miko? What else, what else you got in you? It needs to come out now because this, this is what, this is the time when you just need, you need that to come out. And, you know, we, we do the, uh, we try to do as much char charitable stuff as we could when we, when we could uh, do it. And so that's another thing that's always on my heart, always trying to figure out how could I not just help me and my family, 
but what could I do and how could I help some of the other people that is around me that I know need help? So all of these things is what I've been thinking about, Tom, for months, months and months, thinking about, okay, Miko, what could you do? How could, and so, you know, just to be able to connect like this and talk about it, to me, it's, it's, it's feel like it's one step closer. Yeah, you yeah. know what I mean? Well, for sure. And, and you kind of get an idea of what's, what's out there, what's available. I mean, I, I can't tell you, uh, there's probably been six or seven guests that we have had on this podcast that decide, oh, this is a great medium. I'm going to start my own podcast, which you could do. You're great at it. You're a great mm-hmm. talker. You've got tremendous stories. You've got tremendous passion. Um, it's hard to make any money at it as I've found out so far, but you know, I mean, you can, you know, it, it, all it takes is creative thinking, man. You got a lot of talent. You're, you're a, you're a real talent on the back of the boat. You're a real talent with a fly rod in your hand. And, you know, you could look at things like the first thing I thought about when we talked the other day was looking at the golf industry and in the golf industry, somebody might have their favorite golfer, right? And, and this guy right now, they're not playing golf because they, they, you know, COVID same thing. They can't have golf tournaments for a long time. And so this guy's like, well, you know what? I'm just going to accept um, where I am, I'm going to do what I can and I'm going to offer for people to send me videos of their swing and I'm going to help them with it. And, you know, it costs whatever it costs and, and they're doing it completely online and they're talking to the person, a little coaching session and they're communicating with their fans. They're getting, they're getting a much deeper uh, level of communication and, and therefore that fan is a fan for life. Like this guy yeah. helped me to, you know, he put 20 yards on my drive. Like this is incredible. Mm-hmm. But I think that for you, like you could do the same thing with fly casting. You could, you could offer for people to send you videos of fly casting and then you could be a, a like a coach. And I know all of your customers would, would, would pay for that. Yeah. I mean, I think they would, but I mean, that's just the first uh, thought that I had, and I'm probably thinking way too small, honestly, like right. you could, you could do whatever you want in this day and age with the internet and, and the technology that we have. I just, I, I think it's completely limitless. And I think that, you know, it's just a matter of, you know, doing exactly what you're doing. You reach out to Chris Dombrowski, you're talking to him like, Hey, what do you think? And you reach out to me, what do you think? And you just keep talking to people yeah. and, and it's going to become clear for you. And, and yeah. what will become real clear is, is, um, you know, when there's, when, when the travel opens back up and the Bahamas are back going and, and everybody's yeah. doing the things that they want to do. But I think yeah. you're dead on that, that you can use this time to not only communicate with the people that already know who you are, but, but cultivate a whole new, a whole new tribe of people that, that, yeah. you know, want the me experience and they want, they want to, uh, learn how to do the Michael Jackson turn and, and catch a ball. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know what that usually re- results in though is people just they they do the turn but they they've got two wraps of line around their their feet oh, and yeah. they end up either going in the water or breaking off the fish that they just hook so yeah not, not yeah, everybody can do it like miko <laughs> <laughs> you're right <laughs> I, I had my I had my trial and error time until I got it down back on. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's something that you do out there by yourself in the boat while you're exploring. You don't you don't want anybody to see the mishaps. <laughs> that's, no, that's no. a bad deal. <laughs> so about the casting, like, tell me about. Um, I mean, you're obviously a phenomenal fly caster. That's uh, that goes along hand in hand with your reputation. And then when you see you hold a rod and 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 use it, it's it's very impressive. You're very good. Uh, so how did that happen? Like, when did you get a rod in your hand uh, as a kid? Did you just steal one of your your granddad's rods and and take it My down dad. to the dock or what? <laughs> or or was that like a a rite of passage? Like, here's here's the rod. Go go learn. It was, it was more, it was, it was right in between. It was more like I steal the rod. And, and so <laughs> <laughs> it was my, fa- it was my father's rod. Uh, I think I was, I was probably 12 years old when I, um when I, when I grabbed his fly rod. So my dad, my dad still loved to wade. Like he, he weighed 70% of the time. Like anyone who loves to just get out the boat and walk and wade and fish. That's my dad. Like he loved it. I mean, his car, if you see the cops on his, on, on his feet, like they're like, this. <laughs> so, so it's something between stealing your, your, your dad's rod and, and a rite of passage, huh? 
Yeah. So my dad loved to wait and he he would take me on the flats with him, right? And this one day he waited for a long he goes, he goes forever. And this I was like, I'm not, I'm not going, I'm gonna stay in the boat and you can go. And he he always have an extra rod when he goes out. Now, Tom, back then rod was difficult to get. My dad used to get rods when he have a client who had a rod that he didn't use and wanted to give my dad a rod. So my dad was very particular with his rods. You, you don't mess with his fly rods, mm-hmm. okay? You just don't mess with the fly rod. And, you know, back in the Bahamas, things change now. But back in the days, you know, we they don't shy away from, from putting the belt on you like that. We just grew up like that. That's just the way. It, it ain't like that now as much. But back in the days, you know, that's what that's how we grew up. So anyway, he went fishing. He went wading. Tom. He went out of sight. And I, I'm sitting on the boat and Tom, I've, I've never paid much attention to the bonefish and the way they feed. And about 10 bonefish came about 30 feet from the boat where I was, and they were tailing. I'm talking about digging and, I mean, feeding. And I looked all the way down the flat. I barely could have seen my dad. I looked in the boat. I saw his rod <laughs> all the way up. And I couldn't resist. I, I literally, I took his rod out. And I stripped off a little bit of line. I, I said, I'm going to do what I see him do. I stripped off the line and I whipped that rod back and forth a little bit, Tom, and that fly dropped out there. And before you could say, what's that? Bonefish was on and he was screaming. I mean, the reel was just screaming. And I'm excited, I'm afraid at the same time. <laughs> I'm excited. <to> have- <laughs> Excuse me. I'm excited to have a bonefish on. But I'm afraid because I'm using my dad rod that I didn't ask him to use. And he's far enough away. Tom, when I boated that fish, when I landed that fish and I got that fish off, I was so excited. I ran, I ran down the flat. I got out the boat and I ran all the way down the flat to my dad to tell him, to let him know that I caught a bone fish on his fly rod. And when I told him that, I didn't feel the belt or anything across my back or my behind. And that was the beginning of it. He was excited. <laughs> he, <laughs> excuse me. He was excited for me, Tom. He was more excited for me at that moment than I was for myself. And I really believe that was the defining moment for me when it came to, hey, when it came to, this is, this is, this is it. I'm going to use this rod here for a long time. And, um, that was it. I didn't get whipped for using this rod. I think if I had told him I used it, didn't get that fish, I guarantee you, I probably was going to get whipped. But um, he didn't whip me because of that, Tom. And that's how, it, that's how it started for me. I was 12 years old. I'll never forget that. Um, running to him just to let him know I got a fish. And he was happy instead of upset. And that was, for me, I think that was the beginning of uh, me and Fly Casting. Yeah, and from yeah. then, I just, I just wanted to get better and better and better at it. And so till I end up right where I'm not spinning out of the line and trying to cast with no rod and all that type of stuff. And just do that to keep me, you got to do things to keep you sharp, keep you going. I hadn't cast in a while though, Tom, but it's like riding a bike. It's like riding yeah. a bike. Something, tells, okay something tells me you're going to be okay. Uh, something <laughs> tells me you're going to be okay. So uh, you have a, a young son now and ha- have, have you noticed a defining moment like that with your son to that he is all into fishing all of a sudden, or has it always been that way? So um, it's he he um, it's always been that way. I when he was like seventeen months, I had you know the, the little uh, bag carry thing you put your, your yeah. kids in. Yeah, the well, baby I, I would put, I, yeah, I would put him in that, and I would go down along the beach with my fly rod, and so he he used to be sort of hanging out and. Other, and I'm I'm casting and you know what I mean and so he he at that age he was sort of around it and the only thing I would do is when I get the bonefish I would sort of hold it up in front of him and a couple of times he tried to put it to his mouth like to eat it and I was like hey you can't eat that um, so he was around it for a while but I'll say this Tom um, for me watching my son about I I don't know if you could recall the last time they had the eye cast here in Orlando yeah but. Um, my son was there, as I told you, he cast at the casting point. Okay. Now for him, he didn't have a clue what was going on for me. I'm freaking out like, Whoa, I didn't, 
At age 12, I was sneaking trying to get a fish with my dad rod, and at age 12, he's casting that I cast fishing. So, but like uh, hundreds of people watching him. And for me, watching him as a son, um, I probably took that moment from him, but inwardly, because I was so proud. And I'm thinking, oh my God, he don't know what's happening. Like I'm looking at this pool with T and Thomas and Thomas and all these, all these brands, you know, their names are on this pool. And I'm thinking, he don't have a clue what's going on with him. But I watched my son um, at that show. I watched him shot like 55 feet of line um, doing a double haul. And they have this stuff on YouTube, by the way, Tom. Yeah. You can go on YouTube and actually see some of these videos. But anyway, for me, I thought I thought that was a defining moment for me. Now, my son just loved the outdoors, Tom. He loved to fish. He loves the boat. I mean, he don't want, when I get him out on the boat, Tom, he don't want to leave. Like, he don't want to go, oh, one more spot. One more fish. I was like, hey, we got to go. No, just one more. That's the type of kid he is. He he loves it. Um, and I think I think just like me, it's in his DNA. Um, he's going to do. Course. He's going to try. Other, he's going to try other things. Obviously, he's going to go to school and do what he has to do. But I can almost guarantee you, um, it's it's there. He he. If I tell him leave school now to to just stay on the boat, he would say, "Okay, daddy, I'm not going back to school." <laughs> but obviously, I wouldn't do that. But yeah, Tom. He he. Um, when he was four, he started fly casting. He he tied flies. He tied his first fly when he was four. I liked it so much. He submitted it. To, he submitted his fly to Orbis, like you know, Orbis sells my flies. Yeah. He submitted his fly to Orbis also. Orbis loved the. They loved the fact that it was a four year old who tied it. Um, uh, they loved the fly, but it's like, man, we have the same type of fly here, so we cannot, you know, we we can't copy this fly. But it was like, just let him keep tying because he's going to come up with something that they will. So he already at age four, he submitted a fly to Orbis. He started fly casting, and so he started a lot early. I started at twelve. He he started started uh, at age three and four. But he is um, we, he's a little beast. We call it. He's a little beast when it comes to the fly and when it comes to fishing. So he loves it. He he he's he's crazy about it. Yeah. Well, one more in the in the uh, Pender Glinton uh, yeah. guide guide. Uh, what do you call it? A a a, a dynasty. Dynasty, it's a, yeah. yeah, it's a yeah. guide dynasty, and and uh, yeah. there's one more. Are there any other young males in that uh, in in the dynasty m- making their way not, up? Or not females? much more. Like uh, it, it could be anybody. Like I don't know why I said young males. Gu- girls can guide too. Yeah, you know what? I there's a couple of ladies on Grand Bahama that I think has the potential to be great guides. Um, I think Tom, the, this brings us to to where I think where. I think we need to be, the industry needs to be when it comes to our concern about the next generation. I, I, I truly believe that. Um, I believe the ne- I believe we this we, we still have a lot of good guys when it comes to this generation. When it comes to the next generation, Tom, I think um, it's going to be, in the Bahamas, it's going to be a little lack of great guides um, because there's not a whole lot of young young guys like my son like he's just he's he's rare obviously it's rare because it's he's crazy about it it's in his blood um but there's not a lot of other kids that um it's is into it tom and i think that's what brings me to one of the passions that i have is to really take the wealth and knowledge that i have in this industry and to make sure that i figure out a way to transfer it to the next generation that's one of the things if you see the plans that i have it's one of the things that i want to do before before i hang it up yeah. is to make sure that i help transfer or you know this wealth of, of knowledge over to the next generation right. that's going to be so crucial well when we first started this conversation you said you know i didn't study bone fishing in school i didn't do that and and it kind of i, I almost asked the question right at the beginning like do is that something you can study in school in the Bahamas now? Like, is there something there or could you create that for, for someone to, you know, for, for like, even if it's just one class to let kids know, like this is an opportunity and there's an opportunity to make a lot of money here. And this is how you would get started and just kind of put them on that road. Um, I'm sure that that would be a possibility, right? Yeah. Tom, um, you write about it, Tom. I, it's it's not in the schools yet. 
Um, I've I had I, I've tried a little bit. I've tried a little bit with um, with the Ministry of Tourism, and they were dealing with the Ministry of Education, um, but they were sort of channeling it through me. And I did I did like a they had like a fishing conference uh, that they had me to sort of be one of the keynote speakers, and I was talking about the the vision of really having this in the schools. Um, that that was good for the moment, and then. You know, that's a whole different world that I'm not in yeah. when it comes to the politics. But it was good for the moment, Tom. And then it sort of, it had a big hype and then it just sort of dwindled away. Mm. But I wasn't the person sort of in charge. I was just the person that they were using to sort of get this message out there. And so what I'm thinking, Tom, what I believe is I think the government, he has a lot to deal with. There's a lot going on. And when it's like that, I realize certain things they're not thinking about. But um, I think from some of the things that I'm trying to do and establish, I think um, I could easily create an avenue for for that to happen. Mm -hmm. You know, um, whether it's through some of the other stuff that I want to do, um, I think is an avenue where I can create either like a fly fishing school or fly fishing class, something where kids can come to the Miko, whatever or whatever it's called, and I, you know, between me and some of the other professional guys, I know David Jr., my dad, even Senior, who is still alive. Um, you know, I have a lot of people around me who have a lot of knowledge. And and then I'm I'm involved with Bonefish and Top and Trust. You know, Bonefish and Top and Trust made my son the youth ambassador. Oh yeah. For but well, yeah, yeah. He in last year, October, they made him the youth ambassador for the BTT. Um so I'm, I have a relationship with all of those guys. And you know, Tom, to, to create something uh, to cover the whole scale of fishing or fly fishing, you do need all those different components. Yes. You need BTT, you need, a, you know, they need to know about the environment, they need to know about everything. And I believe that I have those people around me who will be willing to say, hey, if you're going to do this, we, we're willing to come in and help. And I'm glad we're talking about this because for me, this is really, really important. For the government, I think it is, but I think they just have a lot of stuff that they're focused on. And this is probably way down the way down the line for them. Yeah. It seems like uh, I'm a little confused of why the, the young kids might not be, uh, or there might not be a lot of young kids that would be interested in fishing because it just seems like, you know, guides in the Bahamas are kind of, really, really yeah. important people. And, and, um, it, you make a lot of money, you know, and it seems right. like that would be, you would almost need to be kind of born into it like your son, rather than just open to anyone that could, could, uh, you know, work their way right. into being a guide. Like, where would you get a fly rod? Where would you get all this other stuff? Uh, but why is it that you think that not a lot of kids are, are involved right now? Yeah. I don't think they, um, I don't think they have the, knowledge of it enough i think i think they they do they do look at someone like myself and they say hey you know he's doing great you know uh he's you know he's being able to take care of his family and you know and you know have a, have a good enough life i think they're seeing that most of the kids in the outer settlement like mcleanstown and those small little towns where we grew up fishing those are the ones that sort of get into it more once you start to get into like the city almost like in the city part of it, they sort of a little clueless when it comes to it. Yeah. Um, so I think it's just a, the lack of, of knowledge in that area. I think if they really, um, if, if they were sending me, say, say for instance, they were saying, Miko, once a month, I want you to go to each school once a month and we're going to have a classroom full of kids and just go and talk to them, share about how you know Liam Neeson and Michael Keaton and, you know, just by them knowing that, um, it sort of caused them to hey, let, what? Let, let me listen to this young man. Let me see what's going on. I think even as simple as that is, Tom, they hadn't done that yet. Yeah. And I'm wondering if, hey, uh, do I keep waiting for them to do it? Or do I create a, a you know, avenue just probably just like we're doing now yeah. and just, hey, just talk about it, you know? Yeah. Well, so, you know, you've got so many, you've got so many great talents and so many, uh, 
uh, good ideas. And uh, I have no doubt that that's all going to become clear for you and you're going to you're going to know exactly what to do. And I tell you what, when you do, we'll do as many more podcasts to, to explain it to people as, as we, we can, because you're, you're an awesome guest and, and I'd love to be able to help you out in any way I can. Um, but Miko, as far as right now goes, um, how could people follow you? How could they learn more about you? How could they support anything that you're doing? Yeah. So, um, most, most of my interaction is on, uh, Facebook. So it's Miko, M-E-K-O Glinton, M-E-K-O Glinton on Facebook. So you can find me on Facebook. Um, I, I am on Instagram also, and I would do I would do certain things on Instagram, a lot of photos, and I'll try to update people on uh, Instagram. And I think you have it. I think it's Okimo1234 yeah. on Instagram. <laughs> and um, if they want to email me, Tom, if they want to email me, they can email me at O. K E M O seven at hotmail.com. And um once once I get my website completed, um, I would definitely put that information out there. The website would be great because I would be able to put a lot of everything that I'm doing on the website. Um, people would be able to go to the website and, and get all the information that they need. Um, so so that's where they can find me for now and tell until I continue to build. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, it sounds good, Miko. Thank you so much for your time today. And uh, you've got some great stories and it's just good to reconnect with you. And uh, if I can do anything for you, let me know. And uh, you have a lot of people on this podcast that would love to support you. So um, let us know what good. you're doing. All right. Thank you so much, Tom. I want to say thanks to you again, too. And it's good catching up like this. And yeah, I'm, I'm open anytime. Obviously, you can tell I'm a lot, I'm comfortable that you're a good host. So yeah. I'm, I'm good. <laughs> I appreciate it, Miko. All right. We'll see you later next week. We'll have All another right. great guest just like Miko Glinton right here. See you. Yes. All right. See you later.